The concept of electric fields is not alien to most people. It is generally invoked in high school and freshman physics classes while trying to explain why like charges repel and unlike charges attract. The electric field due to a point charge, such as this one, may be represented by a set of radial arrows such as these. They are pointing inward because the charge is negative. Another negative charge some distance away would experience a force from the field of the first charge. If we were to move the first charge by a small amount, say to here, then there would be a change in the direction of the force on the second charge, thus making it aware of the change that has occurred. But does it know this instantly? These videos are taking longer to make than I imagined. <clears throat> Welcome back. Today we will stick our feet into the ocean that is electromagnetic radiation and we will dabble a bit in Fourier analysis. Two negative charges, two electrons for instance, could be employed in this way to transmit information, but said information has to travel the distance at a finite speed. If these fields are in a vacuum, or a close approximation thereof, then this speed would be the speed of light. Electromagnetic fields have this sluggish elastic quality to them that allow them to support waves and respect causality and whatnot. Since metals have loads of electrons that are free to move about within the metal, a piece of metallic antenna and some voltage driving equipment is all you need to create an ENN transmitter and or receiver. But what happens when two or more transmitters are broadcasting music at the same time within your receiving range? How would you pick out a signal belonging to just one of them when the electrons in your receiving antenna are equally sensitive to both sources? To tackle this we turn to Fourier analysis. Consider these two changing signals in time. A receiver would receive the sum of the two, but would be capable of distinguishing one from the other, even though they both completely overlap in time. The key is that they have different frequencies. If we were to represent these signals in the frequency domain instead of the time domain, then we can see that the two peaks are clearly distinguishable, that is, non-overlapping. Now the great thing about monofrequency sine waves is that they form a complete basis set. What that means is that any arbitrary signal in time, like this one a cat would draw while playing with your mouse, may be represented as a sum of a whole bunch of sine waves with definite weights or strengths. This lends itself to a frequency space visualization of the same signal, where we can see what frequency components it is composed of and to what extent. A signal that is slowly varying will have dominant low frequency components, whereas a fast, quickly changing signal would have significantly high frequency terms in them. Think of it as a pitch distribution of an audio signal. This along with a myriad of other correlations allows humans to lock on to specific voices in a noisy room full of talking people. But ENM radiation isn't speech. Frequency filtering, however, might help us with our multiple antenna concurrency dilemma. If these two stations choose to transmit their music at different pitches, uh, easy said and done. A great way to upshift your data to some higher frequency is to encode it in a carrier wave at that frequency. There are several ways we could go about doing this. We could change the amplitude of the sine wave to match our pattern, or we could subtly make local frequency changes, or monkey with the phase of the wave by advancing or retarding the wave crests. All cases result in a broadening of the vanilla sine wave monofrequency spectrum to accommodate these variations. The faster the changes in the data pattern, the broader the spread in frequency. So if these two gentlemen were to pick two carrier frequencies that were sufficiently far apart so that their data spectra wouldn't overlap, then they can safely transmit their advertisements over the ENM field in the same space at the same time, and any radio affectionado with some primitive electronic components with tunable temporal response properties can tune in to the desired channel whilst ignoring the other. So here's the demo. Okay, what I have here are two antenna for transmission and one for reception. And I have two function generators Right now, putting out sine waves, one of them at 71 kilohertz and the other one at 57 point something. And I have some filtering electronics, you know, an inductor, a few capacitors, and a few amplifiers. So I can select with a frequency band to only receive one of these two carrier frequencies. And on top, in the oscilloscope trace, um, the yellow trace, is what I'm receiving right now. So if I put my hand in between the antenna, you should see the yellow trace change in strength. Right. And if I change my receiving electronics 
by throwing in an extra capacitor like this, I can change which channel I tune into. Now to demonstrate that, it's kind of boring to just look at carrier frequencies. So I'll use my trusty computer and play some tones. Okay. So we return to the oscilloscope. So what we have here is the audio signal. And this is the carrier, one of these two carriers that has been modulated to match the audio signal. And with a little bit of electronics, I can take this received signal and demodulate the original data. And apart from a little bit of noise, it looks exactly like what I started with. And that's not all of it. When I change my filtering circuit by throwing in this capacitor, I change which frequency I demodulate. Let me just change the trigger here. There we go. That is a separate note. Right. So I'm using the computer to transmit two separate notes in the left and right channels. And I'm mixing both those channels, one of them with this carrier frequency and the, and the other one with this, this one. And by changing my filtering electronics, I can tune into one of them and not the other. Let me just change the trigger once again. So that's not as exciting. So what I have here is a, uh, an ADOM speaker. And we can actually try and listen to what we have demodulated. Now that's a note. And when I change the filter properties by throwing in this capacitor again at the right place, I listen to the other note. Let's make this a little more exciting. Instead of playing monotones, let's play some actual music. This is um, The Lady by Regina Spector. And you can see that we are able to demodulate the signal and recover the original audio data pretty well, apart from a little bit of noise. And let's see what we're playing on the other channel. This, I believe, is uh, Sky Harbor, uh, a progressive metal band. And if I remove this guy, we return to Regina Spectre. I tried to pick two tracks that sound quite different from each other so that you can see the contrast. Now, an interesting question is what happens if I tune one of the carrier frequencies so that it starts to match the other? We can try that. And we lose all coherence. So we can try that with the other channel as well. We can put this guy in. And move this guy. Closer to 57. Then we get absolute garbage.
This is a lot easier to see if we return to the monotones. So as I tune this guy up, we can't tell the correct signal from the wrong one. We have created a world that is increasingly reliant on the ENM spectrum to function. In order for people and devices not to interfere in each other's frequency spaces, we have evolved standard bands that are meant for specific services and protocols and have installed a licensing regime with limits on time, range and power. Squeezing more and more channels into an increasingly cramped frequency range has been a perpetual PhD generating engine in electrical engineering departments the world over. Tune in next time for more ENM radiation action. Peace out.